What's up, New Spring? How you doing? What a day. What a great day. We survived snowpocalypse and snowmageddon and hashtag earthquake 2014. And now we're here together at New Spring. Today, we have already seen almost 300 people change from death to life. We're praying for 500. We believe we're gonna see God crush that. My name's Clayton King. I'm your teaching pastor, and I get to wrap up the Change series today. This has been a great series. I don't know about you, but every time I see a Camaro now, I look for a flat tire, and I will never think about the term dime bag the same way ever again. We've seen God do great things in this series, and I get to wrap it up today by talking about one of my favorite characters in the Bible, as well as one of my favorite stories from the Bible. What we've been trying to talk about in this series is how God and only God can change a man or can change a woman. And some of you came to church today at one of our nine locations for this service because somebody invited you, because somebody begged you, because somebody bribed you, because somebody tricked you into getting here. But the reason why people have been inviting you to New Spring today is because Jesus has changed us and we know how good it is. We're new people now. We've got a brand new perspective, a brand new life, a brand new future. And because we love you, we want you to experience the same kind of change that we experienced when Jesus changed us. And in the Bible, God is all about changing people. He changes their identities. He also changes their names. And we can see that going all the way back to the New Testament, uh, from the New Testament to the Old Testament. You can see a guy by the name of Abram. Uh, Abram was a, a pagan who did not know who God was. He lived in a location called Ur of the Chaldees. He meets God. God changes his location. He changes his destination. And he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Uh, then we go a little bit further on in the Old Testament and we see a guy by the name of Jacob. He had a brother named Esau. And Jacob was kind of a manipulator and a trickster. And Jacob was in a bad location. He had been getting things dishonestly his whole entire life. One night in a dream, he has a face-to-face -face encounter with God. He wrestles God. God changes his location. He changes his destination. And he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And then we get to the New Testament, same exact thing continues to happen. God keeps changing people. Uh, one very famous person that we know of that God changed identity and name was a guy by the name of Simon. Simon grew up in Capernaum, a small little fishing village right by the Sea of Galilee. He meets Jesus. Jesus changes his location, moves him from Capernaum to Jerusalem, uh, changes his destination. He eventually ends up dying a martyr's death, tradition tells us, being crucified upside down because of his faith in Christ. And Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. And then today I want to show you my favorite character in the New Testament besides Jesus. I want to show you how Jesus changes a man's life named Saul. There are two Sauls in the Bible. There's an Old Testament Saul. He was the first king of Israel. Uh, he was a very attractive and handsome guy. The Bible says he stood uh, head and shoulders above everyone else. But he had a fatal flaw. He, uh, he wanted to please people. He was an insecure leader. And that flaw eventually cost him the kingship of Israel. And we fast forward to the New Testament and we see another guy named Saul, probably named after the original one. And he ends up being a religious guy. He's a Jew. He's not just a Jew, but he's a Jewish leader. He's a Jewish expert in the law. He is not just a rabbi. He's a master rabbi. He's an expert in all things religious. And he has has a fatal flaw, and his flaw that needs to be changed is that he is all about himself. He's doing all the wrong things for what he thinks are the right reasons. And we're going to pick up this story here in just a moment and see how Jesus changes not just Saul to Paul, but how the only way any of us can ever be changed is if we have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Anytime somebody meets God, anytime somebody comes face to face with Jesus, he has the ability to change them if they are willing to let him. Uh, when you meet the right person, they always change your life. Raise your hand if you're married, every campus, every location. Keep it up if marriage changed your life. Keep it up if marriage changed your life for the better. And even if it changed your life for the, for the worse, you better say better because your wife is sitting right beside you. 
All right, put your hands down. When Shari and I met one another, uh, we changed. I went from being single to being married. Uh, my entire lifestyle changed. We also changed names for each other. Her name is Shari, my name is Clayton, but we have this pet name that we call each other, Liddy, and I'll tell you how that, how that happened. Everybody needs a pet name for their spouse. Some of you have cute ones, some of you have dumb ones, some of you have very private pet names that you'll never share in public because nobody needs to know your personal business, okay? But we were laying in bed one morning and she rolls over and she goes, you know, me and you, we're the little ones. I'm like, the little ones, what are you talking about? She goes, you know that old song from Sunday school? Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. She's like, we're the little ones in that song. We belong to Jesus. And so we started calling each other little one and then we started calling each other little and then that got shortened to lid and it wound up Liddy. So I call her Liddy, she calls me Liddy. You better not call her Liddy or I'm gonna rip your tongue out of your nose hole. Okay, but, but that's just kind of a, an example of how when you meet the right person, that person changes everything about you. That's what happens in this passage of scripture that we look at today from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and following. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. That's the modern day country now of Syria. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that was the original uh, name for the Christian faith. And, and if he found anyone there that belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Understand for a second, Saul thought he was doing God a favor. Saul was a religious man. He was as religious as you could ever get. He had spent his whole entire life trying to keep the rules and the rituals and the regulations of religion. But it had left him empty. It had left him absolutely bare of joy. So he is going to Damascus to arrest Christians so that he can keep the Jewish religion pure of all of these quote-unquote fanatics who believed that Jesus was really the Messiah. Don't miss this. Religion never changes anybody. Amen. Rules never change anybody. Regulations never change anybody. Rituals never change us. It is only the grace of God that changes us. God's love, God's mercy, God's affection. Only God can change a person, not rules, regulations, rituals, or religion. So the Bible says he was going to arrest these Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. It tells us in the next verse, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, light in the Bible is always a symbol of the presence of God. And understand this, Saul, who was a man who thought he knew God, didn't really know God at all until God showed up in Jesus Christ and revealed himself to Paul or to Saul. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, and he says his name twice, and that's very powerful in Jewish language, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? If you go and read the previous chapter, you'll understand that the first Christian who was ever killed for their faith was a guy named Stephen. He was an awesome follower of Jesus Christ. And they stoned him because of his faith in Jesus. The Jews didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah. But the man responsible for the first killing of a Christian was Saul himself. He was the one who brought the charge against Stephen. So Saul's whole agenda in life was to arrest Christians and make sure that they didn't hijack the Jewish religion. But when Jesus appears to Saul, he asks a question, why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul had never driven a nail into Jesus' hands and feet. He didn't put the crown of thorns on his head, but we know that the church is the actual body of Christ. So when the church is persecuted, Jesus feels it. When the church is hurt, Jesus hurts with us. So Jesus is appearing to Saul, and he's calling him out by name when Saul is on the road to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now, don't you think this is a curious question? Who are you, Lord? Well, if you don't know who he is, then why are you calling him Lord? Apparently, this face-to-face -face confrontation with Jesus was so powerful and so undeniably real that Saul immediately knew he was in the presence of God. And that's how God changes us sometimes. 
We're going about our business. We're on the road to work. We're on the road to school. We're on the road to a career. We're on the road to a marriage. We're on the road to a relationship. You think you're on the road to a great career where you can retire early, and you think you've got it all planned out, and when you least expect it, Jesus shows up in your life. For many of you, today is that day that the bright light shines, and your eyes are open, and you're knocked down off your horse, and you realize that Jesus is more than a historical figure. You realize he really is Lord. That's what Saul realizes. Who are you, Lord, Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. I I just put myself in that situation. What would I have felt if I had come face to face with the resurrected Son of God with railroad spike scars in his hands and his feet that day? I believe it would have changed me too. Look at what happens next. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus doesn't just want to change Saul and save him in that moment. Don't miss this. Jesus wants to change Saul and continue changing him forever because when Jesus changes you and saves you, he's got a job for you to do. He doesn't just save you to sit around. He saves you to serve. He changes you so that you can help other people change by meeting Jesus. So he tells him to go back into the city. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but didn't see anyone. Now we can learn something from that. Saul saw the bright light, saw Jesus, and heard his voice. The people who were traveling with him didn't see Jesus even though they heard the sound. That means we should not superimpose our story of salvation on other people. Let me explain that. The only way we can get saved is by repenting of our sin and trusting Christ alone for salvation. That's the only way. But we all get to that point in different ways. So if you've never struggled with homosexuality, then please don't stand in judgment of somebody who does struggle with their sexuality whenever they meet Jesus and he begins to change them. If you've never struggled with alcoholism, then please don't stand in judgment of somebody who can't go a day without wanting a drink when they come to Jesus and ask Jesus to change them. We all have our different experiences. If you've never been sexually abused or if maybe you were a virgin when you got married, please don't stand in judgment of somebody who brings a lot of sexual baggage with them to Jesus and then Jesus changes them. We all see and hear his grace differently, but we all must respond the same way by saying, Jesus, I turn from my sin and I I give my life to you so that you can change me. So it says in verse eight, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. He could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Apparently that vision of Jesus blinded him. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Three is significant. It's symbolic in the scripture. Some people would would remember the story of Jonah, three days in the belly of a whale, told in the Old Testament. We also remember the story of Jesus. He's crucified, buried in the tomb, and he's in the tomb for three days before he's resurrected. Some of you have have been needing change for longer than three days. You feel blind. You've tried to change. You've tried to change everything. You've tried to lose weight. You've tried to eat healthier. You've tried to quit smoking. You've tried to quit getting drunk. You've tried to quit looking at porn. You've tried to stop losing your temper and getting angry. You've tried to spend more time at home. You've tried to be on the internet less frequently. We've, we all try things so many times but we fail, and the longer we fail, the more frustrated we get when we can't change. Three days he's blind. He didn't eat or drink anything. But then in verse 10, it says in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision and said, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Here's how we know that Saul has already changed. He's immediately saved. Here's how we know. First of all, he calls Jesus Lord. He identifies him as God. Second of all, he's immediately praying after he's changed by being in the presence of Jesus. So we know that Jesus changes us when we're saved, but he also continues to change us forever and ever and ever. In other words, if you're a Christian, you never stop changing. Jesus is always changing you because growing people change. It's one of our core principles here at New Spring. 
It says in the next verse, Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. In other words, Ananias wants to make sure that Jesus has got the right guy. He's like, are you sure you want me to go talk to him? If this is the same Saul I know of, he's coming here not just to arrest and, 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 and incarcerate a bunch of Christians. Hey, Jesus, he's here to arrest me because I'm a Christian. Don't you love it whenever we try to give Jesus some information that he already knows? <laughs> and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. It's almost like Jesus is saying, I know that you think that you've thought through a scenario that I didn't see coming, but I've already been to the future and I know what's there. So you just go ahead and do what I say, go. I want you to go pray for this man. He is my anointed vessel. I've got a job for him to do. Because when Jesus changes you, the change puts you to work. Look what happens next. Ananias does exactly what he's told. Jesus says to him, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. In other words, the apostle Paul, who is still named Saul at this point, has just met Jesus, isn't going to have the destination he always thought he was going to have. It's changed now. He's not just going to be a rich Pharisee. He's not just going to be a religious leader with influence and fame and power and authority and, and, and a platform. No, his destination has changed now. He's going to suffer for Jesus. Verse 17 says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. That's another indication that Saul is a Christian now. He is referred to as a brother. He's not just Saul the persecutor. He's Saul, our brother. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has changed him from a religious professional to a blind guy in a foreign country with nobody there that he knows. Now he's about to change him again. He's going to take the scales off of his eyes and he's going to fill him with the Holy Spirit so that Saul can do the task that God has for him. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Later on in Acts chapter 13, we find out that his name is now changed to Paul. This is a really, really amazing story for anybody who has ever wanted to change, but just felt like you couldn't do it. And the good news for you is you can't. You cannot have real, meaningful, lasting, authentic change unless you meet the God face-to-face -face who alone can change you. There are some things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture and from this story. Number one, Jesus changes your location. He changes where you're at. Jesus changes your location. Saul was on his way to a city called Damascus, so that he could persecute Christians. The funny thing about this story is Saul still wound up in Damascus, but it was a different Damascus when he got there after meeting Jesus. Here's the thing, Jesus wants to change where you're at right now. He's not just interested in sending you to heaven one day. I mean, we're all gonna go to heaven if we're saved, and I'm looking forward to that. But Jesus wants to change you now. He doesn't wanna wait till tomorrow or next month or next week. He wants to change your location right now. When Saul got to Damascus, he no longer saw that location as a city filled with Christians that needed to be persecuted and locked up. He now saw Damascus as a city filled with other lost people who needed to meet Jesus and be changed like he had met Jesus and been changed. So here's the deal. We've already seen almost 300 people saved today. We're going to see more than 500, I believe, by the end of this service at all of our locations. But for those of you that do give your life to Jesus today, I want to be really honest with you. Tomorrow is not going to be a perfect day. You're, you're, a matter of fact, those of us who know Jesus, we can attest to this. For those of you that are going to be changed by Jesus Christ today, you're going to go to the same job tomorrow that you went to on Friday. 
Unless you've got the day off because it's a holiday or unless Snowmageddon Apocalypse Earthquake 2014 happens again. You're going to go to the same boss that you can't stand. You're going to work with the same co-workers that you don't get along with. You're going to go to the same public school or Christian school or university class with the same teachers or professors that give you trouble. You're going to eat lunch with the same people that say ugly things about you on social media and Twitter and Facebook. But it's going to be a different location because when you meet Jesus, the scales fall off your eyes. And you begin to see the location where you're at. I don't care if you're standing in line at the Waffle House to pay for your meal or if you're at a football game surrounded by 90,000 people. Wherever you find yourself after Jesus changes you, that is now your mission field. Somebody asked me one time, Clayton, what's your mission field? I said, wherever I'm standing, wherever I'm standing, I'm on mission. He changes your location because the way you see people changes. Once Jesus changes you, you realize he can change the people that you love. He changes your location. Even though you still wind up in Damascus, you see it differently. Number two, Jesus changes your affection. He changes the things you care about. Jesus changes the things that you desire. It tells us in verse 18 that that Saul was baptized. That's what I call an all-in move for him. When, When Saul decided to be immersed in water, that was... a a public identification with Jesus Christ. The minute that Saul was baptized, uh, he is showing the world, I don't love the religious system anymore that I came out of. I don't love the laws and the regulations and the rituals anymore. I don't love the money and the fame that I used to work for. Now, I love Jesus so much that I'm willing to publicly identify with him and go all in. I'm not a poker player. The only two card games I understand are war and blackjack. But I like watching poker on TV just because I get all wound up. My my heart rate goes up and I see these high rollers. If they've got a really good hand that they believe is unbeatable, they slide all their chips to the middle of the table and what do they say? All in, right? That means they've got something in their possession that they think is better than anything else in the world. Their hand can beat all the other hands at the table. This is what happened to Saul and this is what can happen to you. When Saul met Jesus, he realized my whole life, I've been trying to find happiness, joy, and peace in a religious system that won't work. But then he met Jesus and he was like, I'm done with that. I'm changing. That's what some of y'all are looking for. You thought that you could find joy and peace and change by making more money, building a bigger house driving a better car, finally getting your kids graduated from high school, paying for their college, getting the braces off of your teeth, finally getting a girlfriend, finally having a boyfriend, getting that date to the prom that you've always dreamed of, the right prom dress, going to the beach and finally getting the tan you've been looking for. Am I being silly? No, every single human being is looking for something in their life to make them happy and we search and we search and we search looking for that one thing that will affectionately fill the gap and the hole in our life and we'll search endlessly and fruitlessly until we let Jesus change our affections. Listen guys, I'm... I'm not a great Christian. I'm not. I'm not perfect by any stretch. I mess up all the time. But I'll tell you what I know. I know that I love things differently now. I love different things now than I used to. I was talking to an alcoholic one time who said, I love to drink and I hate to drink. And you can never understand, Clayton, what it's like to wake up in the morning and crave a drink so bad and want it so bad, but hate it so much. He said, if I could just find a way to change my want to, so that I didn't want to drink anymore. That's what Jesus does. He changes your want to. He fills you with his spirit and his spirit transforms you from the inside out. So some of you right now are being skeptical and you're thinking, I could never change. You don't know what I've done. You don't know about the abortion. You don't know about the addiction. You don't know about the pills I've got hidden right now. You don't know about the bottle in the car. You don't know about what I do on weekends, Clayton. You just don't know. I promise you, if Jesus can change Saul, he can change you. If Jesus can change me, he can change you. He can change your affection. Jesus also changes your destination. He changes the end of the story in your life. The story of your life is not over because if you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. Do not write the end of your life story yet because you still got a lot of living left to do. And if you will let Jesus change you, he'll also change your destination. 
That not only means that you'll be with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth when this world passes away, but it also means that he's got a job for you to do. He's got places for you to go. He's got things for you to accomplish for his kingdom. You know, the apostle Paul always wanted prominence when his name was Saul. He wanted to be respected and revered by the religious people. But once he gave his life to Jesus, he was given prominence but he was given prominence for a different purpose. He stood before kings and rulers and governors. He preached the gospel to Gentiles and Jews. He wrote half of the New Testament. And today, most everything we know about the church, we know because God changed a guy named Saul and turned him into a new man. Amen. He will change your destination. But I want you to understand something. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants a new destination. But if you want one, if you want a different destination, it starts with changing your location. If I want to lose 20 pounds, I got to move. If I'm in a bad relationship and I want to get out of it, then I've got to change my location. The decisions we make today are creating the future we will inherit tomorrow. And so if you are in a place in your life where you know you need to change, then you've got to start by changing your location. And the only way you can change that location is to recognize that Jesus is right there in your life. He's right here right now speaking to you. He's been using other people up until right now. In this moment, he's using me to talk to you on all of our campuses, on the internet, watching by video. You can have a different destination, but it starts by changing your location. I fly a lot. I fly for a living. I'm, I'm your teaching pastor here, but... Uh, I do a lot of other things. I'm also the campus pastor at Liberty University, one of the campus pastors, and I preach there most Wednesday nights. And last month, I was supposed to fly to Lynchburg, Virginia from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, my location is Charlotte. My destination is Lynchburg. I don't want to stay in Charlotte. I want to go to Lynchburg. But I got an email that morning from U.S. Airways that said, your flight has been delayed. Well, I know what that means. That means come to the airport and sit here all day while we give you little to no information, and then somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m. after you've been here for 18 hours, we'll tell you that your flight's canceled and you're welcome to sleep on the carpet on the floor in the airport until we rebook you any, any time between now and 2017. So I go to the airport, I get to the airport, I go to my gate, gate E5, E5. And as I'm sitting at E5, they kept pushing the departure time back. So I'm texting my friends at Liberty. I'm like, hey, I may not make it in time for campus church. Have a plan B ready. Get somebody else ready to preach. Do, tell the band to play a little bit longer. I don't know if I'm going to make it to my destination. Well, after about a three-hour delay, they put us all on the plane. And everybody had been griping. We hate U.S. Airways. They're a bunch of liars. They don't tell the truth. We're never going to make it to Lynchburg. And the whole time, I'm just thinking, Lord, teach me something through this because I don't want this to be a total waste. I want to learn something. We get on the plane. They take us out on the runway. They rev the engine to take off. There's a popping sound. <laughs> Pilot comes on and says, that sound you heard was bad. So we're gonna take the plane back to the gate and you're all gonna deplane, but please stay at gate E5. So we all get off the plane. I've, all, all I've got are my carry-on bags. I don't usually check a bag. I've got a computer bag and a duffel bag with a change of clothes because I'm a guy, that's how we roll. I only need one pair of shoes, ladies. Did you hear that? One pair of shoes, it's enough. So I pick up my bags, I go off the plane, I sit down at gate E5 with you know 80 to 100 other angry flyers. And they are so mad. We are gonna be here all day. Why don't they tell us the truth? Can't they book us another plane? You'd think these people could get it right. And we're sitting there for about an hour. And I'm texting my friends from Liberty, still on the ground. I'm stuck at E5, I'm texting them. I'm stuck at E5. Then I hear an announcement over the intercom system from across the terminal. Gate E4 was directly across the sidewalk in E-terminal. And I hear a woman's voice say, this is the final boarding announcement for all passengers on flight 3416 departing out of gate E4 for Lynchburg. And I looked around and that was the other flight that was leaving around 645. Our flight had been delayed for so long, we're now we're now up to the time for that flight to leave. And I thought, what could it hurt? 
I pick up my baggage. I cross over the terminal. I walk up to the lady as she is closing a giant steel door that leads out to the runway. I said, ma'am, can I get on this flight to Lynchburg? She said, you got a ticket? I said, yes, ma'am, but my ticket is for the flight that's stuck at E5. She said, oh, you ain't getting on this plane. I said, why not? She said, the door is already closed. Now, I've learned a little bit about getting what I want. (laughs) And I said, but ma'am, a woman of your authority and prominence, (laughs) if she so desired, could open that door and give me access to that plane. She looked up from the computer. She goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. She said, I bet you a good one too. (laughs) Give me that ticket. I hand her the ticket. She looks at my ticket. She goes, we got eight open seats on the Lynchburg flight. You want one? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, do you have baggage? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, where is it? I said, I've got it with me. She said, good, as long as you can bring your baggage with you, I can get you to your destination. She opens the steel door. I immediately thought about all my friends at E5. Stuck at E5. I turn and I start yelling, hey, there are seats available at E4. Come on. And they're all looking at me, griping and complaining. Who does he think he is? What is he, some kind of special person with a face? Who does he think, how does he get a seat? I'm like, no, there are seven seats left and I'm begging people to come. One guy picks up his baggage, walks across the terminal. He goes, hey, can I get on that flight? The woman goes, you heard the man. I got seven seats, give me your ticket. She walks him out. I turn back around, hey, for all of you stuck at E5, There are six seats left. Two other guys walk over. Can we get on this flight? Woman's like, give me your tickets. They walk on the flight. I turn around. I'm like, hey, four seats left. And I kid you not, I kid you not. There was this one guy who had been griping the whole time. I hate flying. The reason why this plane isn't taking off is because of me. I'm cursed. When I get in line at Walmart, the cash register breaks. When we're eating at a restaurant, everybody's order at my table is wrong. The gods are against me. And I thought, what would it be like to live your life where the forces of nature have conspired to make your life miserable? I look over and I see that guy look at me and literally do one of these and turn around and say something negative to a friend. Woman at the ticket agent, the ticket agent lady, she goes, hey, They a bunch of fools, come on. Walks me out on the plane, got on the plane, four empty seats left on the plane. The three guys are telling me, man, thank you for telling us. Thank you for having the courage to go ask if we could get on this flight. We're gonna reach our destination, aren't we? I'm like, Lord willing, yeah, we landed in Lynchburg. I I got off the plane and I walked up to the ticket counter and I said, I was booked on a flight out of Charlotte. And she goes, oh, that one is still stuck at E5. That flight has been canceled. They're not coming to Lynchburg. The Lord showed me, and he's about to show you. You wanna change? You gotta move. You wanna change? Then quit sitting back at E5, complaining about how bad everything is. You wanna change, then quit blaming everybody else. You wanna change, there is a plane that will take you to your destination. You're stuck at E5, pick up your baggage and bring it to Jesus and take everything you've done, your sin, your wickedness, your mistakes, bring it all to Jesus. Only Jesus can open that door. Only Jesus can give you access. Only Jesus can get you to your destination. You are wasting your time stuck at E5. E5 is Saul and Saul is going nowhere. E4 is Paul and Paul has a destination with Jesus Christ. You are stuck at E5. Now it's time for you to change to E4. I pray right now in Jesus' name at every location and every campus, Holy Spirit, would you convict sinners and save them and change them right now. With your eyes closed and your hearts open, I invite you. 
every campus, every location, if you need to change, if you need to be saved, if you need Jesus to change you from the inside out, would you pray to him right where you sit? I'm inviting you to change by repenting of your sin and trust in Jesus. Pray this to him right now. If you wanna be saved and if you wanna change, call on his name right where you sit. Jesus, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. I turn from my sin, Jesus, and I give you control. I'm all in, Jesus, and I'm all yours right now. Thank you for changing me. I belong to you. I'm a new person right now. Now with your eyes closed and your hearts open, every campus, don't even delay when I ask you this question. Nobody looking around. If you just prayed that prayer to Jesus and you ask him to change you and save you, will you right now immediately and without any hesitation, would you raise your hand straight up above your head right now at every campus if you just prayed that prayer to Jesus? Put them up. Straighten them out, not halfway, all the way. Raise them up, high as you can get them. Now, everybody with your hand up, just those of you that prayed to receive Christ, just you, I want you to look at me right now. I'm gonna look at everybody. Look at me right now if you just prayed that prayer to Jesus. In about 10 seconds, I'm gonna invite you. I'm gonna have everybody stand up together. And for those of you, hundreds of you that prayed to receive Christ right now, the minute I invite people to stand, I'm inviting you because Jesus has just changed you to walk out of your aisle, to walk out of your row and out the back of this building. And some of our staff and some of our volunteers, they're gonna walk with you and they're gonna meet you there. The minute I invite everybody to stand up, those hundreds of you that just responded to the gospel and asked Jesus to change you, when we all stand up together, I want you to stand up and I want you to move out the aisle and to the back where our volunteers and staff will walk with you and meet you and help you take your next steps. That's what I'm asking you to do right now. It's gonna be hard, but you can do it. You know why? Because you're changed. Jesus is in you now. So I'm gonna ask everybody, every location, every campus, all of us up on our feet right now, everybody together, staff, volunteers, begin to walk out the back. And if you just prayed to receive Christ, I'm gonna invite you right now, walk out with our staff and our volunteers, head to the back, go ahead, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Greenwood, Florence, Columbia, go ahead. Go ahead, Anderson, Greenville, Spartanburg, Boiling Springs, head out right now, go right now. Let's cheer them on, let's cheer them on. Let's cheer them on. Don't hesitate. You're new. You're different. You're changed. Go right now. Go right now. Head out. Head out. Our staff and volunteers will meet you. Say excuse me to the people around you. Don't be afraid. Don't hesitate. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Go right now. Go right now. Jesus has changed you and he's got a job for you to do. He's got a job for you to do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. People are, people are streaming out the aisles here at Anderson. Let's just keep on celebrating. Encourage them. Come on. Every campus, move right now. You're stuck at E5. Go to E4. Jesus has saved you. Jesus has changed you. Go right now. People are still leaving. They're still going out. Praise God. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. <laughs> Hallelujah. People are still walking out, still walking out. Praise the Lord. Hey, let me say this. Let me say this. In a second, I'm gonna pray, and after I pray, you'll be dismissed. But, you know, in a, in a, in a day like today when hundreds of people are giving their lives to Jesus, if you didn't have the courage to go out when I invited you to, that's okay. As soon as I dismiss you after this prayer and you walk out the back at every location, some of our volunteers or some of our staff will be there. You just walk up to somebody with a name tag. You walk up to somebody that's on staff or a volunteer and you tell them, I just asked Jesus to change me. Okay, maybe you were too embarrassed or afraid to walk out with everybody looking and clapping. That's okay, that's okay. Jesus saves you regardless of whether or not you stand up or raise, a, raise your hand. He saves you when you repent of sins and trust Christ. And he's done that today for hundreds of people. Lord, I wanna thank you for what you've done in our midst today. We've prayed for big things and you're doing it. 
You're doing it by your power and for your own glory. And I thank you, Lord, for how you change lives and how you've changed hundreds today. You'll continue to change them. Lord, we pray for next week as Pastor Perry begins our brand new series, The Hunger Games. And I pray, God, you continue to work in our midst as we do our best to show people how you can change lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>